and uh, this is to inform you that the session is being recorded and if you do not wish to be recorded uh, you can leave us i hope you don't uh, you can choose to not participate by turning off your microphone and camera though we would love to see all of you on camera and keep the session as engaging uh, as possible this is our second session in the series the first one we did on competency two uh, today's session is focusing on competency three establishes and maintains a coaching contract, coaching agreement. And uh, uh, it is designed in a similar format where, where we do have a series of questions, but uh, how we will not go 3.1, 3.2, 3.2 wise the way we did for competency two, but we're going to take a slightly different approach. And I look forward to participation from each one of you. Uh, before we move further into the session, a little bit of context as to why we are doing this. Uh, the Bengaluru chapter did a survey uh, a couple of months ago in terms of what do the audience wants to listen in the learning session. So we do these sessions every alternate Monday as far as possible. Uh, and we wanted to understand, are we delivering the right kinds of topics that our audience wants to listen? Uh, the winner in the ring ranking was uh, coaching tools. So we will have some tools based sessions shortly. Mm -hmm. And right next to that was coaching competencies. People wanted to brush up their coaching competencies. And so here we are. Uh, we will keep doing deep dives for each of our coaching competencies to wrap it up with competency one at the end. Um, because that really brings together all the coaching competencies together in my view and hence um, I just decided to put it towards the end. So with that, we can get started. And to get us started on the um, topic, I've created an idea board. I'm gonna ping the link to the idea board in the text chat. Yeah, if you can click and it will open a web page. On the web page, uh, it's going to ask you what are the key challenges that you might be facing with regards to establishing and maintaining a coaching agreement contract. Yeah, if all you need to do is there's a plus sign right after the question, you can click on that and add as many post-its. The, these are virtual post-its. You can add as many post-its as you want to list out all your challenges. We'll give it about five minutes for all of us to put in ideas. The good thing though, is if you already see an idea, all you need to do is vote it up by giving it a thumbs up. So I'll be on mute till I see some um, challenges being put up on the idea board. Are you all able to see the idea board screen as of now? Thanks, Johnny.
would be nice if we can also read others challenges and see whether we want to vote yes. it up Lovely. We have some statements on session level contracts and some on overall coaching contracts. So, nothing is. Those who are just joining, I am going to um, paste in the text chat again the uh, link. So all of those who are joining just now, I'm pasting the link to the idea boards. Right next to the statement, you will see a plus symbol. If you can click that, and add your post-it for what your biggest challenge is. You may also choose to read all the post-its already up there and upload them by clicking the voting symbol at the bottom. It will open it into a separate card and you can give it the thumbs up. And that's how you upload it. We'll spend two more minutes if you can spend some time on upvoting before we proceed into the session. Is that Dr. Winston? Yes, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Nice to see you. Pleasure. We have 43. We have 43, yeah. So they're all doing an activity, Dr. Winston. There's a link to the idea boards. I've pasted in the text chat. Um, I will do so again for those who joined a little bit late here. So on the idea boards uh, link, people are posting a response to the question, what's their key challenge with regards to establishing and maintaining coaching contracts and also upvoting others' ideas if they find uh, that it aligns to their thinking. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Bakhtiar from Lahore. Sorry for joining a bit late. Not a problem at all, Bakhtiar. Welcome. Thank you. 
Yeah, so I will uh, hold on to the idea boards activity. Feel free to continue adding any challenges and upvoting. We will be using these shortly. Uh, but to continue into the session here on the slide, you will see the competency three being called out establishes and maintains uh, agreements. Uh, and the entire the detailed um, uh, description of that competency is partners with the client and relevant stakeholders to create agreements about coaching relationships, process plans, goals, and establish agreements for the overall coaching engagements, as well as those for the coaching session. Uh, so all of us know who the client is, the person that we are going to be coaching, but who all could be our relevant stakeholders? You can just unmute and share. Um, a client's organization. Clients organization, thank you. The In client, the leader, his team members. Yeah, the leader for, for whom uh, <coughs> team the coaching is happening. Absolutely. Anyone clients else? of the organization. Clients of the client we have. Clients of the clients we have. Wow, that's a wonderful perspective. Uh, how would they be uh, uh, our stakeholders? I th I'm curious to really understand how would that work? If he has a, a difficulty with how he builds relationships or purposes, ah, lovely. could be valuable. The extent I don't know how you get to them, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I completely hear that. Thank you. Any others? Um, the client's own team, team members, essentially. Hi, this is Sunanda. I'm sorry, my video is not working right now. No worries, Sunanda. Thanks for responding. Yeah, the client's team members. And also, I would think that, you know, client's uh, family. Family, lovely, lovely. Uh, especially certain kinds of coaching where it is so much about relationships, both at work and off work. Definitely family is a key stakeholder. Any other stakeholders we might be missing at the moment? Clients, vendors. Clients, vendors. Thank you. You've called out everything I had on my list except for one and I'll call it out and proceed. Uh, are the learning development or the HR teams who may be uh, you know, organizing coaching for either the leaders or the teams or the team members, yeah? So they are also our stakeholders uh, in terms of uh, how we engage and contract with them. So what we're going there, to do There's also next... another one I'd like to add. Uh, yeah. Uh, see, the, 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 his own peer group, not necessarily in the office, yeah. but friend circle. Uh, and he says, listen, I've been through this coaching and it's working or it's not working. And they, they yeah. become willy-nilly stakeholders. Uh, because they see, if they see growth, then they also endorse completely agree yeah that is absolutely indirectly but yeah they are our stakeholders so true right. so true I, I think i have one uh, one additional stakeholder which i think is relevant for all of us mm -hmm. is uh, ecology uh, in today's world ecology is a stakeholder for all of us in every conversation mm -hmm. so okay. environment ecology is the stakeholder uh -huh. um, because we all operate under an ecosystem Mm. And right now, the way we are uh, progressing, unless that is that is then all conversation for me. So even in a coaching conversation, that's a stakeholder. The biggest stakeholder for me is the, uh, apart from the client itself, is the ecology that we are in currently. The system in which they operate. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'd like to, uh, you know, add to what Deepak is talking about. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, for a long time, I was only uh, depending on Zoom as an example. Yeah. But now I am uh, finding myself embracing every other, uh, many other platforms like Teams, Microsoft Teams, uh, Google Meet, um, WhatsApp Video, and and that's that's something which um, I never looked at as an option till recently. Now I think I just have to. Uh, I find myself, uh, you know, allowing all of that to be part of my ecosystem. Thanks, Deepak, for that. Yeah, technology is becoming a stakeholder in the 
ecosystem of stakeholders that we have to deal with. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, if I may, also, I'm also I'm following. Uh, sorry, please. sorry. Uh, this is Krishna here, and uh, just if I may just add a little bit to what the others have said. Oftentimes, you know, uh, the sponsor of the coaching sometimes is not clear about what coaching is, and they just want to jump in. And they see coaching as a remedial action rather than as a developmental action that can sometimes be a challenge. Completely agree, Krishna. You're talking about the challenges in young. When coaching is seen as a remedial action for uh, fixing people in organizations, it, it clearly is a challenge for us. So that, that, that contributes to challenges in establishing contracts. And mm. Yeah, but following from uh, uh, what Deepak said, I think then the whole world is uh, also involved because one person reformed can actually lead towards reforming others. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Lovely. So now the question is how do we manage to create contracts when there are so many stakeholders, so many permutations, combinations, ways to slice and dice and look at all the stakeholders that we engage with. We'll try and answer this collectively and you know by figuring out a few things. Let's see how this goes. Next up, I'm going to put up a slide uh, that lists six rooms and what you're going to be discussing in each of your rooms. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen that talks about room one, two, three, four, five, six? Yes, we can. Yeah. So room one is going to talk about what does it look like when you don't have an agreement, whether it is an overall agreement or a um, session level agreement. When you don't have this, what you experience as a coach uh, or what might your client experience uh, and how can you build this competency? Room two is going to be talking about what are the key considerations uh, when entering into an agreement for coaching, relationships, process, plans, and goals. What are the things that people need to keep in mind? Room three is going to answer what should we be avoiding when creating an overall and session level agreement. For room four, five, and six, we'll have to pick the top three challenges, and I'm going to bring in... Um, bring in the page again. Give 30 seconds more for voting in case anybody wants to. Otherwise, I can see a clear winner clarifying what coaching is for the coachee. And we've got a couple of ties here. If you can, um, so we also have a re-agreement during the coaching at a later stage and there are some similar things around you know the contract keeps changing very often very similar ones so we can pick that up to be the second so room number four can talk about agreements around what coaching is and is not for the client uh, room, num sorry, room number four room number five can talk about ever-changing contracts and how do we build that into our contracting and is there any other winner is what i'm looking for when coaching asks for advice and very similar I had seen coaching seeks answers uh, and you know coaching wants us to tell us what needs to be done so maybe we can pick these three room six is going to be talking about when the coach is looking for answers uh, tell me a solution fix things for me um, do we understand what we need to do before we break you out into rooms you may want to take a screenshot of this so that uh, once you're in your room, you know what question you have to answer. Sorry, I bring this up again. Can you please repeat the room four, five, and six? Sure. Room number four has clarifying what a coaching, what coaching is and is not for the client. Room number five does uh, contracting with regards to ever-changing agreements. Uh, through the coaching engagement and room number six is going to be talking about um, coaches seeking answers and solutions uh, for the problem they bring to the table. Tanti, for a screenshot, if you can make it full screen, that will be helpful. Uh, this is not full screen, huh? 
now is it full screen yet no it's currently on a presentation mode <laughs> so you can see the second slide also uh, so you're not able to see my the slide show on the screen but you can see my this thing also it is small and difficult to read yes. yeah, yeah. Lost a lot of people. One second, I'm just, I might have to reshare. It doesn't seem to be getting the right thing. Yeah. Are you now able to see it? Still the same. It's still the same, Shanti. If you click on those, I think it's usually the three dots at the bottom below the slide, <laughs> it'll have an option of going to a I slide show. Because it's a dual monitor, it's creating, wait a minute, let me remove the dual monitors, maybe it fixes things. Mm, I'll try sharing again. Yeah, now it's yeah. just one monitor. I'm hoping it should be visible. Yeah. It's perfect now. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So are we ready to be moved into breakout rooms? So room four and room six are related to some extent. If you do a good job of explaining what coaching is, uh -huh. then they won't expect answers. But that's fine. That's a very fair statement, very accurate statement. Yeah. But let's see what comes up. So I'm going to put you into six rooms. And uh, seven minutes for the discussion. Is that good enough? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll bring you back in seven minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you all had a good discussion and let's learn from each other. Can we have room number one? Uh, talk to us about what does it look like when you don't have an agreement and how will you build this competency? Joseph, uh, would you like to start? Go ahead, Sita. No, you can go ahead, Joseph. So we, we were just uh, uh, three of us who were audible, uh, others were uh, silent, mm -hmm. and of which only one person was on video, and the other two were off video. <laughs> And um, we heard from the people who were um, speaking. That was basically uh, uh, two of us. Um, um, they had very similar experiences of 
sometimes not being able to get to the agreement. Mm. And um, it's also the fact that sometimes this agreement, we uh, say that, you know, it should be in the first 10 minutes of a 50 minute session. Yeah. Uh, and, and therefore we can decide what is to be done in the, so sometimes it is not that arithmetical ratio is my experience. Sometimes, you know, I push, for an outcome and the client starts talking and in the end i just ask what 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 did you get out of this and there i find oh my god this client actually is walking away with something hmm. and uh, i'm i'm as a coach realizing that it's it's important for the conversation to have an outcome in in the mind of the coachee and sometimes not necessarily for the understanding and assimilation of the coach. Mm. That's where lovely. I... So that arithmetic split between, you know, first 10 minutes coaching contract you arrive at and then spend the next 20 minutes in figuring out the, you know, the grow model and then wrap it up with this thing. That really doesn't work. Sometimes we spent probably the entire conversation in trying to get to get clarity for the client what is that they want to achieve. And that's a huge takeaway. Totally resonate with that. But uh, yeah, you know, I feel, uh, uh, if I may interrupt, yeah. that uh, having the agreement is so essential that if you don't have that, it just remains uh, an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. So you do need to have uh, an agreement and then you can see you know, uh, both the sides sitting in a very similar fashion. The body language is very aligned and you, the engagement is much more. And you're sure that you, the coach is... The coach is feeling that he's getting about eight or ten outcome of their conversation. Otherwise, he is just kind of uh, wondering. A lot of it is left uh, unlapped, and unwrapped, and uh, unconcluded for himself. Yeah, sometimes I feel that conversation may not even have been an interesting conversation. At the end of it, if the client walks in saying, what was he doing for the last one hour? Yeah. It could even have been interesting, but it just remains a conversation and people Exactly, know. exactly. Yeah. So agreement is definitely very important. And I'm a little bit grappling with how to have the coaching agreement fast because that also needs to be done fast. So there is some trick to it or there's some method to it. Yeah. You know, that's what I want to learn. I would love to leave you with a thought, Sita. Where is the need to arrive at the agreement really fast coming from? Uh, I don't have any answers, but I would like to leave you with that question and thought. What are the thoughts do we have from room number one or anybody now to you know build on what Johnny and Sita have shared? Yes, Suresh. Uh, so the point I was looking for is, does this question talk about the agreement for the session before the session or an overall agreement? It was both. Uh, anything that you feel uh, yeah. you want to call out, please feel free to. Uh, this was talking about both kinds of agreements, the overall coaching goals and the session level goals. Uh, if, the, if it is a session, I think we should spend very, very less time mm. in terms of this reiterating the what was the main agreement and then, you know, go ahead in case the agreement was very clear. Uh, else that might take away a lot of the coaches, coaches' time uh, which is pretty expensive from their perspective in terms of the monetary limit. So, so you are saying that you you would spend time in every session reiterating the, reiterating the overall coaching goal? At a, at a very high level with high level. least sure. time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, Shikha, I see your hand up too. Yeah, actually, I mean, hearing all these conversations, I was just wondering to myself that what really could be the reasons of why you know a coachee does not know what to expect or what is he looking you know from this coaching conversation mm. one is that and second is uh, like if an organization has hired us as a coach um, hasn't it done really that expectation setting or you know what outcome the coachee should be expecting out of those coaching conversations with the coachy before you know he enters into this conversation with the coach so i am you know thinking from both perspectives from the coachy as well as from an organization's perspective that what could be the reason why we land up into such kind of a situation that you know the coachy does not know what is what should he expect out of it or why is he here 
Lovely question. Uh, Emmanuel, I see uh, Nadia, I think I saw your hand go up. You've got two other hands go up. Is it okay if I cover them and then come to you? Yes, no problem. Sure. Uh, we will look at both these questions. I think very interesting question. Does the organizer not take enough time to explain to the uh, coaching candidate in terms of what coaching is, is not what the overall goal from the organization perspective is, what do they want them to achieve? Uh, and I'm sure there are going to be varied answers to this and we'll look at it. Uh, Manu, I see your hand up. What are your thoughts? Yeah, hi. I uh, just wanted to uh, share what was coming to me that, you know, there are three things here in, uh, in an agreement, right? There is the coachee who's a different personality, the coach is a different personality, and then there's a standard which is set for us that, you know, like everybody was saying that 10 minutes, you have to kind of try and get an agreement in place. So I guess there needs to be obviously some sort of flexibility given the personalities. One, you know, if the coach is a very driven person, you know, then they would like to be sort of very cut and dry and try and push the coachee to have a 10 minute of this thing. On the other hand, if the coachee is also like that, then it may work. But if you know, there are different personalities. One, I think, needs to have a flexible kind of, and be aware of what is my personality. Am I being too rigid and driven? Yeah. Uh, but having said that, there needs to be, I guess, some sort of structure put in place, a broad structure. So I guess broad structure with some flexibility is broad there. Broad structure but, with yeah. flexibility in terms of how much time to spend on coaching might help. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yes, Nadia. So uh, I just wanted to react to the first question that was asked. I, I worked with a, a company. Uh, uh, it was an online coaching and, uh, and the company used to give to the, uh, the organization, HR and the coaches, lots of documents, lot of, lots of presentations about what is coaching, what is not, and, and the, the, the agreement and all of that. Despite all of that, uh, some of the coaches uh, were still not sure or like it was blurry or, or sometimes they wouldn't accept during, after, after a few sessions, they would still be wondering, oh, but why don't you tell me uh, what should they do? Give me a solution. <laughs> Show me the way out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've also experienced organizations that say, you know, like, you know, here is a poor performer, either fix them or tell them we have to let them go in the next three months. And I'm like, I'm not here for that, but yeah, you know, uh, and that is not communicated by the organization to the client and they expect the coach to communicate has happened. Yes, yeah. Uh Yeah, you're still on mute. Sorry about that, yeah. I'll talk about the uh, situation where an organization has hired the coach uh, and the coach is different, they're, they're employee or whatever. Um, the, the, the agreement, the contract that we make with the organization is very formal. It has all the, the, the legal terminology and uh, you know the indemnity clause and so on. Um, in, in such a case, then I prefer to make a separate agreement with the coachee directly which I call the, the client agreement, not a client contract. In that, uh, I, I outline what is expected of me, what is expected of the coachee, and so on and so forth. And I think that makes it very clear for the coachee um, how the, the uh, coaching is going to proceed. Thanks, Bhaktia, for sharing the best practice. Um, and I think a few things that are coming up as a summary for question one is that we all need structure around, you know, definitely arriving at a coaching contract and uh, overall contract and the session level contract while pointing back to the overall contract very briefly in each session. We need structure yet lots of flexibility, no hard bound times like 10 minutes for the contract and then move on kind of thing. Uh, and also being able to clarify irrespective of uh, who has contacted us for coaching whether it's the organization or an individual client, irrespective of that, we do clarify in terms of the coaching agreement, uh, what happens in a coaching, what is their role, our role, what might they expect and, you know, uh, assuming that probably they don't know anything and redo it all over before we move into the sessions. Uh, any final comments before we move to room two? I have one comment. Uh, can I share? Yes, please. Yeah. 
um, so the way I, nowadays I look at agreement is these are um, a sketch of what they want, what the client wants, rather than very clear uh, idea of what they're looking for, both the company itself and the client also. They have a broad idea of what they want. Nobody is very clear. Um, and even in a coaching session, they may start off saying this is what, but it changes, you know. Uh, so as long I, as I as a coach don't have an expectation that it should be very clear, I am not under pressure that this is what an agreement is or this is not what an agreement is. If it changes, it changes. If it doesn't change, it doesn't change. That's how I have learned to um, operate, practice. Thanks, Deepak. And that ties into the question Jagdish has put on the text chat. Whose agenda is it to have a contract? What would we say? That's such a beautiful question. Whose agenda is it to? Yes, Nadia. So maybe uh, the, the agenda is not to have a contract, but the contract is uh, like a tool and it protects the coach. Uh, so maybe the, that's the purpose of the, of the contract, but it's not the end. The end is to have a client satisfied. Yeah, yeah. And, and coaching is a partnership. So it is both of our agenda. There is something in it for the client to have a, a, a coaching contract and something in it for the coach to have a contract. It really protects them in so many ways. Uh, and it also protects the client in so many ways. So possibly it's it's a contract is a partnership too. Well, uh, Shanti, I am a little confused because coaching agreement, as I understand, is between the coach uh, and the coachee for that particular session. Yeah. You know, that means how much is going to be what is the coach expecting during those 50, 60 minutes of the interaction? Yeah. Uh, and I hear people talk about, you know, uh, agreement at the client level, contract level. Yeah, so we would, so what are we talking about? Kinds of contract when, and so if it's a tri-party contract, if what you're saying, Sita, definitely works for a one-on-one -on -one contract where your client is paying for their own, coaching and is the sponsor also. So it is a one-on-one -on -one contract. Still, there is an overall, so in the next six sessions, 10 sessions, what is it that you want to achieve? Kind of a goal for the entire set of sessions. And then it will evolve into session level contracts. So yeah. even there you will have both. But what I think people are referring to is when the organization is the sponsor, there are HR or uh, hiring managers or reporting managers who have a vested interest in the growth and development of the coachy and they have inputs to the coach and this is what we want this is what we want to achieve so the contract is multi-party mm -hmm. and that's the kind of contract that people are here referring to when they say you know the sponsor the client etc okay thank you um, uh, may i add uh, another point here the, yes. the session level called uh, the session level agreement is not really a contract of sorts it's uh, if it's a multiple session uh, agree, uh, engagement then the session level will be I ask the client, what do you want to discuss what today? Do you want to achieve what do we session, yeah. exactly? And it's not really an agreement, you're asking it, what should we do? Yeah, thanks, that's good. Uh, it, it, turns in, it, it turns into an understanding, of course, so, yeah. of sorts. Yeah, Pius, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to respond to Jagdish's interesting question whose agenda? I think it is coaching's agenda to have a contract. If you don't have a contract, it's not coaching. You can still listen actively, you can still evoke awareness, you can facilitate learning, but it won't be a coaching session. I think that's how ICF defines how you count coaching hours, in fact. So to me, it is coaching's need. Lovely perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Piyush. Uh, in the interest of time, may we move to room number two? Uh, what are the key considerations in an agreement for coaching relationship, process, plans, and goals? Uh, we had a lively discussion uh, on this, but the time really went on very quickly. I think we just managed to discuss the first part. Key considerations. We'll all build the rest of it, Bhaktia. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah so um, if I may, uh, the group... Uh, 
very well done. Uh, there are so many people, six people there. Yeah, so the basic uh, consideration is that uh, it is pretty clear right at the outset. Uh, again, what we have discussed in the first uh, room also, well, what really is expected of the coach and, and from the coachee, and um, to make the relationship, start the relationship on a sound footing so that um, uh, things are clear and there's no confusion as to what the coach will do, what the coachee will do, and what the organization, if there is one involved, uh, their, their uh, role is in it. That, I think, was the first part we discussed. And I'll invite my friends there to come up, say something else. I know Surekha was one. Who else was there? Yeah, and I'll repeat the question. And anybody who wants to contribute can. What are the key considerations in an agreement for a for coaching relationship, process, plans, and goals? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what we were able to cover, we took it as four separate parts. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the relationship part first, and we were really there. We looked at two aspects. One, it is a direct relationship with the coachee. Mm -hmm. And one is when you have it rooted through the organization, and then there is a coachee that comes through the organization. Yeah. So what were the aspects that we would keep in mind if it was rooted through the organization? And what were the aspects that we'd keep in mind? And the first thing that came to mind was we need to have... Right at the outset, we have that chemistry session where we establish the rapport and make sure that, yes, we are ready to go with each other or at least try each other, try out a session with each other so that we can have a successful coaching session. That was the first thing that came to us. Thereafter, we looked at organization setting in certain goals, mm -hmm. uh, getting the clarity as to what would happen and how it would happen. Uh, so the relationship between the three would really be established and the comfort level would be established. And thereafter, we were all back in the main session. Thanks, Ajay. One question that has always bothered me is uh, an instance where uh, organization goals and the coaches' goals do not meet at all. Uh, they are not in sync. How have the coaches dealt with it? Okay, so... Uh, when we take a coachee from through the organization, there is an invariably, there has to be a process by which the three, the coach, the organization and the coachee need to be aligned that this is what we want as the end result. And that is said, that is spoken in the presence of all three. Yeah. Right. So there's total clarity there. Personally, as a coach, I allow my coaches, even when they come from the organization, to choose one personal developmental area or one personal goal. Uh, the reason is uh, everybody says, I want something for myself as well. Mm -hmm. right? And sec the second thought process that I have is that if the person improves, the organization automatically benefits. So let him take, let that individual, let him or her take their individual goal as well. How does it matter? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Ajay. Bhakti, are you have your hand up? Uh, yes, uh, two situations can arise. One is where the organization is involved and they want you to give a detailed report at the end. Uh, what was discussed, uh, you know, is he good, is he not good? Can he be promoted, for example? They want a report on that and there we have to make it clear that we will not give any such report and we emphasize the confidentiality clause there. And the second one, uh, which usually arises when the organization wants to know how the coaching is going to proceed. There, perhaps we can talk a little bit, little bit about the coaching model that we uh, will follow, we'll adhere to. And uh, about the goals, um, the, the organization's goals may not always uh, be, as was said, uh, the, the coaches' goals. So uh, again, the confidentiality clause, and we let the whole thing evolve as the sessions go on. 
And if there is going to be a report at the end of a coaching series, uh, we, of, of course, uh, I do write in my, it will be in, in general terms without violating the confidentiality sure. between coach and coachee. Yeah. Thank you. Anuj. Yeah, just uh, building on that question of uh, what if there is a conflict between personal and uh, organization. Also, in my experience, uh, one thing that's happening is that uh, if the organization leaders, the sponsors have given some coaching objectives, and there is a basis for it in some reports like 360 or some other uh, documents, then that is a good document to transparently contract with the organization as well as with the individual that the organization shares the same documents with the individual in advance and knows or shares why the coaching is happening and that this is the rationale for the objectives as well. And as an indiv as at the beginning in the first session itself, we can check in with the individual that what are the objectives he or she is looking for and what has come in from the organization side. And if there is a mismatch, try to bridge that gap in communication in the first session itself so that your foundation of the whole coaching going forward is on a sound and transparent footing. Otherwise, you will uh, struggle with the mismatches. Yeah? Dissonance will be there. Lovely. Thanks for sharing that, Anuj. Yeah. Thanks. Piyush. Yeah, I think the sponsor is the organization to me at a three-way call between the coach, the coachee and the sponsor, make sure that the alignment happens. Mm. Uh, also to me, uh, goals are not confidential because that is something the organization and the coach agree on. Yeah. Uh, there could be additional personal goals, but there is an agreement on these that we go forward with. So if there is a misalignment like it's coming up very interestingly, it would show right away. It because, will. yeah. Thank you. To, to sum up, uh, Gopal, Gopal, last one and then I'll sum up. Gopal, what's your view? Actually, the, uh, the experience goes like this. Uh, you are in the tripartite meeting. Uh, when you're out of the tripartite meeting, again, the coach is not convinced. At times, it is felt as a kind of enforcement on him or her uh, to be coach. And how you as a coach can uh, build the context and uh, make it uh, more beneficial from the coach's perspective and how it's going to really just develop him or her on a, on a later part of uh, the coaching sessions or the journey is what is going to build the trust and confidence in you as a coach. Absolutely, Kopal. And this, I'm guessing you're doing it with all the stakeholders involved in one meeting. How many number, tri-party, four-party, everybody is there in the room to talk about what should the ultimate goal be? And there is transparency. That's how I'm, I'm seeing it. Uh, Gopal, correct me if, if I'm not getting it correctly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Bhaktiar. A very some, small com comment here. Where the organization outlines the goal. Now, this is what we hope to achieve from uh, coaching this uh, coachee. Um, my, my question would be, as a coach, would be, uh, have you talked about it to the coach? Does he know? Does she know what uh, your organization's goal is? And that needs to be uh, obvious I mean, that uh, everybody is on board with that. Yeah. And as some of the coaches shared that, you know, have everybody who is part or associated with that coaching to be there in the room as these goals are being discussed, the client, the manager, the HR, the sponsor, Whoever needs to agree on what the outcome of the coaching needs to be should be there as a part of one common call and no, information is not passed on. That's when there is a, a sense of lack of transparency, lack of trust, or what have they not shared with me happening. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Room number three, what should we be avoiding when creating the overall and session level agreements? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Satish here. Uh, a couple of points which the whole uh, uh, team came across in that short time was, uh, uh, which were earlier also talked by the other groups, but the key points which are coming on is, uh, you know, making sure that uh, don't get into a contract which asks specifically for feedback about the coaching. 
to the organization other than other than the program management information like did the person attend the course or did the person take the assessment and things like that but nothing related to the content of the conversations that is number one and second is uh, you know not get into a results focus or uh, agreement with short periods three months six months if you want results focused uh, items onto the coaching contract uh, you know you should really evaluate and build a longer time frame because there are many things which may not be under our control and be clear be accountable for what is under your control and the third thing is you know setting expectations uh, you know before getting into the contract itself and from a from a documentation perspective not to appear too legalese not to appear too inflexible yeah, but also have uh, you know uh, word it in such a way that it is flexible yet accountable both from the coach perspective as well as the coachy perspective yeah i think these were some of the points which were coming up lovely points are not getting into the the, the tone of the agreement not sounding very yeah. legal because not everybody understands that language something that yeah. people understand there is accountability yet there is room for flexibility in it um, there was yes. a statement you made satish uh, what is in our control uh, ah. would like to throw that open back to the group and ask what is in our control i think we can control the process part mm. yeah uh, we can be uh, we can be sure that uh, as a coach uh, we are maintaining the norms we are demonstrating the competencies that are there and we can hold the people accountable for the process mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we can challenge them we can provoke them uh, but not to the extent where the coach loses confidence or uh, you know um, the coach uh decides not to continue it further so there has to be some creative tension that we have to create uh in a in a very in a you know uh, you know there is no hard and fast method but somehow we have to create it that you know it is not too slack or not too challenging uh for the uh, for the coaching for the coaches thank yeah. you being present is what is in our control uh yeah, yeah? thank you nadia you already said it uh, so what is in <laughs> our control <laughs> is yeah. being uh, uh show up as the best version of our, ourselves yeah. because uh, sometimes the coachee might be upset or angry with the organization and mm -hmm. might give some negative feedback about the coach but uh sometimes it's good to to do have a distance between the feedback and also the Uh, say as you said as you said that uh, this is not in our control uh, this is the the coach's reaction but it yeah. doesn't mean that we haven't done a good job lovely thank you nadia huge <laughs> yeah i think the outcome is really not in control it's a joint project and there is there is a role that a coach will play in terms of building awareness but taking it forward in terms of action uh, a lot is up to the coach so uh, avoiding guaranteeing outcomes mm -hmm. which organizations may not like so much yeah. is important <laughs> to keep in mind and to say yes awareness will build how much comes out of it we'll see it's a two way street yeah yeah and organizations i do see a lot of them saying what is the roi give me numbers give me metrics that shows improvement i totally hear you piyush baktiar Uh, I think uh, what I wanted to say, Pius, has already very well said that. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have Emmanuel who's put his hand up. Yeah. No, is there not an opportunity to clarify to the to the organization what coaching is all about? Because sometimes this disconnect is there, and and I face it as well. Uh, I I have the MD telling me, you know, you uh, you want I want you to do this. How is this person doing? and for me the struggle is uh, the coach is on one particular track the organization is on a different track yeah and there is this whole confidentiality so the onus is on the coach to clarify what is and what is not coaching i would say even before taking the contract 
agreeing to coach it is about you know does everybody have a common understanding of what coaching is what it can yes. do what it's meant to do thank you emmanuel anuj yeah actually just uh, reinforcing that it points to a lack of common agreement the moment questions like roi are coming actually the understanding is more like a training or yes you know a uh, different kind of formats but not coaching and uh, the moment such disconnect questions are coming the it's a reminder for us to go back to the contract and uh, clarify like uh, emmy was saying uh, it is extremely important that the organization understands otherwise we are walking down a you know sticky wicket lovely lovely so i think to summarize question 3 we um, we need contracts uh, uh, to, even before we get into the contract to ensure that everybody understands what coaching is is not what it can do cannot do um, while there is an overall agreement there is a session level agreement the moment we see that there is a disconnect to call it out to all the parties and you know ensure that uh, we are realigning on what coaching is um, and yeah thank you thank you Room number four, and I'm going to look at what our challenge was: clarifying what coaching is and is not. Yes, please. Um, I can speak, um, Nadia Venkat, and go ahead, Vilad. Forgot the person's name. He was there. So, so I think all of us had similar experiences of. Uh, of this particular challenge and we have all faced it uh, all of us seem to be having similar responses mm. the few things that we have done is uh, to clarify what coaching is but perhaps also to clarify what coaching is not yeah. and also to clarify what uh, other development methodologies are what is mentoring and what is mentoring different from coaching what is counseling and how counseling is different from coaching what is advising and how advising is different from coaching mentoring um and i think once you open up the gamut of different kind of support systems that exist for a particular uh, client then it's easier to explain what coaching is mm. all of us tend to do a little bit of uh, demo sessions or uh, you know discovery sessions especially i find it that most of my clients are first time coach you know they first time they taking a coaching assignment you know uh so it's um, difficult to to get into an agreement with when they don't even know what it is so that is a that's a challenge and that challenge is also there when you're talking to other stakeholders let's say an hr department or any department or even md who perhaps have never experienced what coaching is um to explain that so these are the things that came up to explain much more clearly what different development methodologies exist and have uh, demo sessions to help the experience what coaching is and what is not Yeah. this is this is what came up in our discussion sure first help the stakeholders understand the difference between coaching training mentoring counseling therapy etc 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 and uh, uh, also give some sort of a demo for them to experience what coaching might look like thank you yes bhaktiar uh, talking about the coaching contract that does the coaching contract say uh, in writing what coaching is what it is not um the the agreements that i've seen uh, the one i i use does not specify all these uh, various uh, uh methodologies like training and like mentoring and so on but it does mention that coaching is not therapy or counseling and it does mention that coaching is not uh, consulting and as as a result of the coaching uh, series or coaching session if uh, you take any uh, have to take any important decisions Uh, financial and otherwise then you should consult the the, the real professionals in that field and but there i have pulled my uh, template from the icf website for the coaching contract it does have right. sessions on what coaching is is not it, it does. doesn't go into the other modalities though uh, mm -hmm. but i have simplified that version i know that that is a very highly technical language being a coach i found it very highly technical to read and understand so i've really simplified it for my mm -hmm. client but it does talk about uh, what coaching is is not but in the chemistry session is where you know that uh, explaining exactly. the other modalities is what i do any other yeah. view any other thoughts johnny you have your hand up 
Yeah, as we are progressing in this conversation, I'm having a fundamental doubt. Mm. Are we are we talking about this in the context of credentialing from ICF, or are we talking in the context of creating a practice of coaching with our clients? Interesting. Mm. Yeah. I think from an ICF perspective, I the only thing that would be relevant is for credentialing the session level contract. Have we arrived at a session level? But here, I think we have already dwelled into the realm of you know creating a practice where we are engaging with multiple stakeholders. Even even if it's not multiple stakeholders, you know, do we have an overall contract and all? Yeah, interesting. I don't think we uh, we gave it thought, but yeah, that's where we have dwelled. Thank you. I see Piyush is coming. Thanks for clarifying, Piyush. Yeah, ICF Code of Ethics requires clarifying uh, coaching to a client before starting. Yeah, and that's where I picked up the ICF template from. Um, but there is your hand up again, or is it from the previous time? Um, what were we discussing? Uh, sorry, let me just. Uh, we were discussing, we were just wrapping up question number uh, three. Should we be, uh, no, we were in. Uh, oh. Room number four. What coaching is for the is client? It? Actually, I've forgotten what I wanted to say. No I Anytime right. you, you can recollect, please feel free to come back. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we move to room number five? I, I had a question, although I raised it uh, in my, what I was saying, is uh, when, you're, uh, when you're talking to a client who has heard of coaching, but never mm -hmm. engaged with coaching, the HR departments are also fairly... Uh, unaware, um, how do we proceed? Uh, that is uh, for me, um, it, this is the kind of peer client that I normally work with. It's not, so how do we proceed in, so with the coachee, we could still do some demo sessions and get them to experience. But what do you do about the wider stakeholders who have- uh, I'm a new entrepreneur. Uh, uh, so Avdeepak, I'll actually wait for some experienced folks to respond and see if I can add on to it. Go ahead, Bhaktiya. Yeah, I remember now. I think an interesting question was asked uh, a few minutes ago about uh, whether we are uh, doing this session to uh, have a coaching practice or to, to be credentialed. I think uh, what it's quite clear that uh, as far as I'm concerned, ICF's credentialing process ensures that we become good coaches and we have a good coaching practice. So the two are inseparable. I think uh, we are doing both. Thank you. Yes, Anuj. Yeah, no, uh, just responding to Deepak's question, I think uh, one of the things that we could uh, which in my experience I've done is uh, reaching out to the organization, uh, asking for a meeting with the key stakeholders, including HR and sponsor and manager. Um, first, separately, before going to the individual who's going to be coached, clarifying what coaching is and what coaching is not in that meeting, first in writing in the pre-read, then demonstrating it more, clarifying any questions and doubts that they have in the meeting itself. So it's really sort of hammered in or reinforced. It's still new to a lot of people, but depending on the maturity of the organization and how many uh, rounds of coaching they've gone through and they've done, people get it, right? Depend it, it, of course, it varies by individual and organization. And, and then reinforcing the same message with the individual in the first introduction mail, which is again copied to HR or HR in, uh, in fact follow, uh, forwards it and uh, reinforcing it again in the first session and then to the limited extent on what coaching is and not in every session. So I also tend to agree with what Bhaktiar is saying that uh, the ICF credentialing and practice ideally converges, but the only thing I, I sort of sense is that sometimes the mismatch that happens uh, may make us feel a bit straight jacketed in the credentialing requirements. And that's when we feel that, uh, is there a dissonance between what the practice needs to be successful versus what credentialing needs? But yeah, in principle, I, I tend to feel that, yeah, the credentialing process and the practice should converge. And mostly it does in my experience. Sure. Johnny? Johnny, you have your hand up? Yeah, 
I, I, I'm happy that Bhaktiar and Anuj shared what they just shared and um, just want to bring the attention to one of the competencies which is not in discussion for today's thing but as ICF coaches uh, we all embody the coaching mindset that's mm -hmm. one of the competencies and yeah. in that Deepak's question is very very relevant uh, whether it's an HR folk whether it's a sponsor whether it's any of the stakeholders that we spoke about as long as we are embodying that coaching mindset we are still demonstrating the coaching uh, process through our being. being. There is no uh, disconnect at all in that process. Just wanted to do it. Thanks, Anuj. Thanks, Bhaktiar, for bringing that emphasis on this. Thanks, Janet. You're welcome. Yeah, I just want to, you know, add on to what Deepak was mentioning about, uh, you know, a sponsor not being aware, actually. I think that's what I heard. Yeah. of what coaching is and what it is not. Uh, so I just want to react by actually asking a question to all the experienced coaches that whether it really makes sense to have some sort of a demo session with the sponsor uh, and the HR folks. So because, you know, whatever is put down in black and white is just that, you know, yeah. you don't get a sense of it till you actually experience it. So yeah, what's the I, sense I, of the experienced I'm, coaches? No, no, I'm not an experienced coach yet, but I have actually done that given the HR and the L&D leaders a demo session so that they can experience what coaching is. Uh, it hasn't materialized yet, but <clears throat> discussions in progress. So I'll wait for others to comment. Anyone who wants to respond to Manu? Johnny says, not a demo session. When we embody the coaching mindset, it is taken care of. Thank you. Gopal, you want to add? Uh, yeah. Who, who I, I, I just want to compliment what uh, Manu uh, really talked about. It's, it's always better to get the first confidence of uh, sponsors who are really, because they are your internal uh, ambassadors, uh, even in promoting uh, the the selective uh, clients or the coaches for us, right? So, uh, unless they give the real positive backup, uh, it's very difficult for us to be now the coaching in the first instance. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I did see one more hand go up, but can't see it now. No, uh, it was me. Uh, yeah. I put up my hand and then I saw Johnny's uh, comment. Uh, but what I'm thinking is when you say demo coaching, uh, with whom will, who will be the coaching? From yeah. the organization or somebody else? I had done it for the LND and the HR, two separate 30-minute uh, sessions that got them to experience coaching. And now they're still deciding whether that's the solution they want to want for their employees. Um, but I, yeah, it took us a long while to even get there to, to help them understand what coaching is, what it can do. So, so Emmanuel, uh, if I can also respond to that question yeah, of yeah. yours. Yeah. I recently had a very interesting experience with a manager check-in with uh, one of my coaches and the manager happened to be the founder and CEO of the company. And after the 20 minute check-in, he, he said, can I keep coming into your sessions when you have this with your, I said, why would you want to? He said, I'm getting benefited from this whole thing because the questions that you're asking me uh, seems like provoking certain things within me. I said, please sign up. Uh, <laughs> please sign absolutely, up. Yeah. So it's 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 see um, when when I when I see a sample of the food, it, in a sample packet, it it has a sample value. But when I take a scoop of the dish from the dining table and I taste it, it is a real sampling. Mm. What I think uh, if I can add, uh, I can't agree more uh, with what Johnny said. Uh, you know, we all use this word pro bono. Mm. Okay. And now we are talking about a demo. And the simplest example is, why didn't you allow them to taste? Mm. And what you have done is the amazing thing. Uh, because if the taste is not good, let them not sign. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that, that is where we are again in the present moment. This is what is coaching. This is the boundary. This is the scope. 
So yeah, that's my two cents. Thank you, Suresh. And I think Piyu, uh, Piyu seconds what you're saying that you know unless and until the HR and the learning teams or the sponsors are actually convinced, uh, coaching may not fly for that team for that organization. I have had a change of uh, heart listening to uh, Johnny. Hmm. I think uh, because we've been talking about doing and join, Johnny's been saying about being. The being of a coach is more important than the demos that we give. You know. So the being is the being of a coach is what needs to be uh, practiced, and if that we can inculcate, then the need for the demo sessions over time will vanish. So uh, totally agree. Uh, I think be there when you are doing it. Yeah, to build that expertise that while you are explaining to them what coaching is is not, be a coach. Yeah, and they let them experience it. Lovely. Thank you. Room number five. Who's from room number five? So I was there <laughs> and uh... Narayan Murthy. Get us um, started, Piyush. We'll all pitch in. All right. And Mano was there too, and Emmanuel. So we, we were looking at recontracting and change in contract. Uh, so I would like others to add as I speak, but one important thing is to have the coach, have the contract in hand as the coaching progresses and any shift there needs to be renegotiated or talked about. Uh, unless that awareness is there, you may get distracted and move away. So that is one bit. The other was the coach should have a dynamic view and allow the change to happen and it can't be very fixed. I think earlier we were talking about uh, the flexibility and the structure. So hold both together yeah. is what came up. Uh, then contracting for session and contracting for engagement, distinguish clearly between the two. And while it may be okay to have a specific session for a specific reason that the coach he brings in, the overall engagement contract does need to be overarching, needs to be brought up, at least in terms of awareness to say what is happening to that, mm -hmm. both for the client and the sponsors. Uh, that's some of the things I said. I would invite others to add from room five. So, Piyush, one of the things what we also discussed was on the growth of the coachy, and that might require a certain amount of if, if the coach is lost in time when the first contract took place and doesn't perceive that the kochi has grown, uh, uh, then it is one situation. It's important for the kochi, the coach to be sensitive and aware that there's a dynamic model of the kochi as well, rather than a static view. You should have a dynamic view. And that would help uh, recontracting because whatever was done at point uh, time, time one uh, may not hold in time two. Yeah, yeah. So, so therefore, there's an opportunity to recontract. That's my uh, view. Emmanuel, can you give a, an example um, of how this happens? So, so, uh, I, 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 so I met with someone who was. Uh, I mean, I, I'm coaching someone. Six months ago, there was a lot of issues around about uh, the contract was around work related issues. Mm -hmm. And there's been a certain amount of growth and those have got sorted out. Now the coachee wants to look at something more deeper and personal. And personal. Uh, but if I'm stuck on that thing that, oh, we are talking about work, as per the initial contract, then perhaps one is, you know, uh, stuck in time. But mm. understanding that growth mm. has taken place and therefore recontracting is helpful. That's that's my uh, 
experience, I would say. And that's uh, what I've seen with the different people and over, over, you know, time. Uh, that's, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, need of the coach changes. Yeah. Okay. That's right. um, and this is something uh, interesting for me, if I may comment. Um, for me, changing a contract, really uh, what I experienced in my practice is when the contract needs to be terminated uh, prematurely or the contract needs to be expanded. Um, these are the two situations which I've experienced. Because uh, in my view, the uh, needs of the kochi uh, does change as we go along. And uh, as I've been doing executive coaching most of my time, after a few sessions, I've always discovered the real issues involved are of a personal nature. And then I turn into life coaching. So uh, the, the, the nature of coaching changes, but the fundamental purpose still remains the same. However, if there is a drastic change, then uh, I would say the previous contract will be cancelled and a new contract is made. What would define a drastic change? And can you share an example? If you can? <laughs> well, I haven't experienced any such thing yet. Uh, for example, they say, okay, this Kochi is uh, now leaving the organization. Can you do the remaining sessions with Mr. So-and-so? That would be a drastic change. Maybe not in the requirement of what the client wants to work on, but that is a change in the circumstance in which the coaching can proceed or cannot proceed. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to um, check my understanding, Bakhtar, if that's what you mean. Um, I, I have an experience uh, where an organization nominated a senior executive for coaching, and uh, he really wasn't keen he was just, uh, you know, being forced to take this coaching. Uh, for the first session, he came half an hour late. Next session, he didn't show up. <coughs> third session, he came, but he didn't show any interest. So after the third session, I talked to the HR and said, I'm sorry if uh, the person is not committed, we'll have to cancel this contract. So that was the change I had to make, cancel the contract. But uh, beyond that, I haven't had much experience in uh, changing the terms of the contract. Thank you. We just have five more minutes and can we have room number six uh, come up and share what they discussed. Okay, I can chip in and uh, Pradeep Singh was there, Dr. Winston was there, myself. So room number six uh, talked about uh, what we <laughs> talked in the time that we had uh, overcoming some technical glitches it was about uh, you know, a client, probably quite a few typical clients when you start out wanting advice, wanting solutions, give me the answer. Uh, so, so what we discussed was, uh, you know, it obviously goes against the very rationale or the very, you know, basis of coaching, uh, which is really if one, at least I would look at it as a process for learning and change. Uh, so given that, uh, one was that, you know, there has to be a mindset change. We can do it nicely uh, for the coach to essentially, or rather coaches, so essentially that they have an understanding of the difference between consulting and coaching. So uh, one view was that uh, if one had a consulting practice and a coaching practice, you could easily compartmentalize that and say that, you know, that's different. Uh, we'll have to, you know, that's a separate uh, process entirely or an engagement entirely. Uh, but also show them or uh, give them an opportunity to understand the benefits of coaching itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one way to change their mindset, uh, to my view, would be, in my view, would be to explore more deeply what the client wants, uh, what they feel about and what they want out of the situation they brought up uh, initially and out of the coaching process itself. Uh, an an uh, advice or an answer uh, to their problem is really an outcome. 
and they're kind of going straight to you saying that, okay, you've got experience or you're an experienced person or whatever. And, you know, what would you do if you were in my place? Yeah. Uh, the other is, uh, you know, the benefits is kind of related to the benefits of coaching. What would they want, uh, you know, as an outcome going forward, which would help them across multiple situations, not not just this hill to climb, but also all the future hills that they want to climb. So, so it's really opening their mind to the benefits of coaching. Uh, that's about what we discussed. Thanks, Nikhil. Anyone wants to add? I have a question where um, the third session after saying that, you know, uh, in a conversation where I said, uh, I, I pointed them back to what coaching is that I'm not going to give them any solutions. The reaction was, if you're not going to give me solutions, I'm not sure what I'm here for. The candidate went back and asked HR to stop the coaching sessions and that happened. And two months later, the HR wants to reinitiate the coaching with the uh, client. So maybe sometimes I'm feeling it just takes a while for the coachee to even realize what benefit is, but it hurt me. It hurt me and I was like, am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right track? What would you want to say when, when a client says, mm -hmm. I don't see any benefit, you're not giving me any solutions, I don't know what to do. Yes, Bhaktiya. Uh, yes, I think uh, there is a, an issue there. There is a dilemma really. Uh, the client gets stuck somewhere when you, you know in the coaching process and he or she says well tell me how to go about it now as far as the strict conditions imposed by icf are, are concerned no suggestions no advice uh, this was drummed into us during the training that i attended if you give a suggestion you will fail the icf test but then practically i've experienced over the last many years that if the client does get stuck, I don't see any harm in giving a pointer of which way to go. Some guidelines, not really a solution, not really a suggestion, but getting him out of the rut uh, if he's there. Interesting. I've not done that. Uh, I completely stayed away from it. And uh, I thought the uh, there were two candidates from the organization, one continued, one discontinued, and the first one is coming back again. So I'm guessing some magic happened in these two months where the candidate would have reflected and uh, maybe saw some benefit and is coming back. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that's, other... that's just to, just to prove that coaching does not only happen during sessions, but it also happens between happens sessions. Between sessions, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank that's you. A good point. But I have a... You know, it, there's always a struggle and and for those of us who've been career managers uh, and leaders in organizations uh, you know the default mode is to give a solution that, that's the default you're expected to do that but uh, and that's why I sometimes think uh, it's not an easy transition yeah. so but I found that asking the questions holding the space enables the coachee to perceive for herself or himself and that is more long-lasting than what we call uh, advice or a solution given we know it but but again we don't know the context that person is going to be working whereas in a sports field to some extent they can say try this if this happens but it is not the same in an organization yeah. so so that's that's my take and I've been training myself to keep away from the temptation to, to, to give the solution. Thanks, Emmanuel. And Pierre says I would take the client away in time or space and ask them to advise themselves, like a role play. Love that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, sometimes coaches uh, take a shortcut rather than giving advice. They say, when I was in this situation so many years ago, I did this. That also is actually giving tacit advice. Yes, yeah. 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 We are coming to the close of the time. I will stay on. We can continue the discussion for a few more minutes. But before participants leave, 
I'm pasting a link to our next session, which will be hosted by Jaya Bhatija uh, on the role of systemic, systemic, definitely there's a typo in team coaching and ICF team coaching competencies. We'll be discussing the competencies in detail uh, and look forward to seeing as many of you there and we can get back to our session. Totally understand those who have to drop, feel free to drop while we exchange a few more comments before we wrap up. Thank you. Any other thoughts on competency three, anything that might have emerged for you? Well, I, I want to ask if establishing a contract is essential, you know, but if there is only one session uh, coaching required, there having a written contract is too much work, both for uh, the person and for the, the coachee. There is a verbal contract sufficient or not? That's the question I want to throw there. Lovely question. I've never engaged in a one session coaching. Anyone who's who has that experience and can share. I did it with a neighbor. It wasn't uh, executive coaching. It was life coaching. And it was powerful. And yes, we did have a contract. Not a written one. Not a written one. I, I don't see ICF saying anywhere you must have a written contract mm -hmm. in the competencies. As long as you have a contract, then it's a coaching session and you can do it. Thanks. Organizations is different. Written is better. This protection needed, etc. Especially I, I happen contract, yeah, one session coaching. Sure, thank you. I I happen to do um, not one session, but a two and a half hour one session coaching. That was a long session, and of course uh, we spent a few minutes on establishing what we want to achieve there. Uh, but we didn't write it; it wasn't a written contract. Uh, but if I remember correctly, ICF requires a written contract. Uh, is that correct? I can't remember. Not, not to my understanding. Contract no. is either written, verbal, or even an emotional contract. Okay, good. Thank you. And uh, and the, and the answer to the earlier question for me, even if I've been coaching a person for about a year, it's just only one conversation at a time. Mm. And each conversation starts off with what you want. How can I help you? Yeah. How, what do you want to think of today? What do you want from today's session? What do you want to walk away from today? Yeah. I have. I'm all eager to hear Jagdish's uh, unmuted mic, so I want to hear him yeah. if I can. Go ahead, Jagdish. <laughs> no, I mean, for me, I've been listening to the entire <clears throat> conversation. And uh, I've been reflecting upon the way I do it. And, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I don't remember all the points, but. Uh, uh, you know, there was something discussed about where people probably don't know about the coaching and you need to clarify on coaching. I would say that, uh, you know, my experience is that, that you know, I, I work with about 20 different organizations and every one of them is, is absolutely uh, clued in completely onto coaching. Uh, however, there were some new clients who came along and uh, the HR head, uh, or no, no the LND head uh, uh, was probably, you know, uh, you know, transparent enough to say that I don't understand enough of coaching. So I sent her about six or seven different articles uh, to read about coaching. And then I asked her, uh, let's have a half an hour session and uh, please send me three or four questions that you have after reading these articles. Uh, the idea was to know whether she's read those articles. Mm. Uh, you know, it's very easy uh, to say, I don't know enough. So tell me more, tell me more. 
Uh, you know, we, we, you know, I, I always look at that statement, which I read many, many years ago, and they say that opportunities come in overalls. And it means there's a lot of hard work to be done. And therefore we don't accept those opportunities. So you have find a lot of LND people who say, no, no, tell me more, tell me more. Uh, and and uh, there was a time when I used to believe that, you know, especially when I was president of this chapter, uh, that it's my job to go and, and, and uh, uh, you know, part of my job to make, make uh, everybody know about coaching. Uh, you know, and I say today that, you know, there are different channels for you to find out. Uh, please go and find out, uh, uh, you know, and do let me know if you have any questions. So I, another point which came up was where, you know, do we, do we contract for one or we don't contract for one session? I don't contract for one session simply because uh, whenever somebody wants one session, I do it pro bono. Uh, I don't charge for that. Uh, and I, I stick to the 60, 65 minutes. I, I don't charge for that. And then they say, but why are you not charging? I said, no, uh, uh, if you benefited from the session, it's great. Uh, that's my contribution to, con to coaching. There were some other points which came up and, and you know, uh, uh, where people resign in between. I've had two, three different uh, such cases. And uh, one case was where he, where the person left, the coach he left because of a restructuring with the, within the organization. Uh, when I spoke to the HR head, uh, he said, you know, Jagdish, uh, we have contracted you for 12 sessions and this man is leaving because of the uh, restructuring within the organization. And he's really pissed off with that. So I would suggest you continue coaching him and the company paid me for the re re remainder of the session. However, another company, when somebody left, uh, uh, they did not, they said, just close it. Mm -hmm. There is a new client who is now talking to me. And uh, there was this, there is this person who was supposed to be the CEO, promoted to be the CEO. And now he's not been promoted to the, be the CEO. They've got somebody from outside. So they've contacted me to coach him. And they told me the background. Now I know for definite that this man is really pissed off with the organization. I haven't met the coachy. I haven't had a chemistry session, but I, I can imagine, you know, uh, that a person who was to be the CEO is not becoming the CEO, has not been become, has not been promoted. He's definitely pissed off. So I told the, the HR head, uh, whatever number of sessions you want to contract me for, uh, I'm going to be asking for the entire payment in advance. So he said, why? I said, simply because I'm sure he's going to leave. So he said, but then what is going to coaching be? Uh, is coaching not going to help? I said, no, coaching is not prescriptive. Hmm. Coaching is something else, you know, and please understand what coaching is. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go into, go, you know, talking to him about what coaching is. I simply said that you'll have to pay me all the sessions in advance. And that made him sit up and ask this question. I said, now you go and find out what's coaching. You know, mm -hmm. and, and then if you have, a, if you have a, a questions, uh, call me up. We'll talk for about half an hour to 45 minutes. But please go and do your homework on, on coaching and what coaching is all about. You know, so I, I, I handled these things a little differently. My contracting uh, is with the organization and I have a separate contract. Like I think Bhakti are talked about it. Where, you know, I do a, a declaration, uh, me as a coach, and I ask the coachee to sign a declaration as a coachee. And there are, there are about 12 points in that. Yeah. And besides that, every session, I mean, I say, are we moving towards your goals that you have identified? Yeah. And what is it that you want to take away from today's session? I ask both those questions. And then it comes to goal setting. Uh, I don't ask the organization about goal setting. I said, I, 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 the first session is where I do a tripartite with the boss, the coachee, and the sponsor. We are all together. And I say, please, we are looking for directions as to what do you want us, what direction do you want the coaching to move? Moment I call it a goal, they, they ask, or they, in their mind, they're really looking for a result. I'm saying it's a direction that you're telling us. It's, it's not a result because the result very clearly and is specified in the contract depends on the effort put in by the coachee. You know, very clearly mentions that. And therefore I'm very clear that 
uh, you cannot hold me responsible because you don't know how much effort has been put in by your coachy yeah i mean these are some of the points that came to my mind i just said let me share uh, johnny does that uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Text chat also. I'm seeing lots of thank yous, Jagdish. I'm sure. This is Words of wisdom, Jagdish. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jagdish, for the honor. Mm. My pleasure, sir. Shanti, Shanti, I beg leave. Thank you very much. We had a great session. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you Shanti, for thank a wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Based out of Bangalore, we of course look forward to seeing you on 19th and then 24th in person. So. Right. Let's make it a great day. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Shanti and everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Nice meeting Thank each one of you. Thanks for your contribution. Good night. Good night.